thrilled that you're here today. Just before I get started, uh, wanted to give you a little update on where we are in our expansion and construction project. And uh, concrete has been uh, poured for all of our floors. Um, there's some significant areas, uh, pylons that are being poured this coming week for steel. The good news is the steel was actually delivered a couple weeks early. And so we're thrilled about that. Yeah, let's just thank God for that. You're never really sure how that stuff is going to go. And uh, they actually they brought the steel in this last week on Friday. Two of our huge girders came in 15,000 pounds apiece. It, it took our entire staff to get that off. The, no, just... <laughs> That's not how that really worked. And uh, footers are, are uh, uh, being uh, formed and, and poured for our main entrance. Uh, also, you'll notice uh, in just a couple of weeks, all the area of our new parking where it's stone and graded now, uh, that'll actually become paved. That'll make it a lot easier for those of you who are parking a little bit further away. And so we're thrilled for all the progress that is happening because our goal is simply to provide a safe place for people to find faith, friends, and the future. And so I'm very grateful for the efforts that you are making for that to happen. And uh, just take a look as you leave the campus today, just kind of look around the, at all that's going on. It's fairly impressive. Um, what I want you to see this morning, we, we just, we're doing a two-message series on neighborhood. And our staff wanted me to wear a sweater and uh, tie my shoes and, and sing, Won't You Be My Neighbor? And that's not happening, so. But, <laughs> yeah, that's what you all say, until you see it, then you can't unsee it. That's. What we learned last week in the story of the Samaritan was that our neighbor is not just someone who, or our neighbor is someone who is near us, not just someone who is like us. Often we look for and move towards people who are a lot like us. But it's the ones who are nearest that might be our divine appointments. So last week we kind of answered the question, who is my neighbor? This week we want to answer the question, how do I neighbor? And for the Samaritan, we saw some specific things that he did. He saw a person who had been beaten, left half dead, naked, on the side of the road. And he just moved in. He... he he disinfected and bandaged up the wounds. He actually picked the person up and put him on his own donkey, which meant he probably had to walk after that. He got him to the equivalent of a bed and breakfast, and he, he, he took care of him while he was there, and he, he gave the innkeeper some additional resources financially and just said, you know, keep him here for a couple of days, and if, the, if it requires more money than this, then, then I'll pay it when I come back through. And here's the, the challenge is that for most of us, that's not the scenario we run into. We, we don't really come across someone who is beaten and left for dead on the side of the road. That, that's a very traumatic experience if you've ever seen it. And we do come uh, with, we, we are exposed to images like that on television or we hear stories. And our emotions can be stirred there's no real option to exercise. And here's what I want you to see, is that there are lots of people all around us that are wounded and bruised in ways that are not obvious to us. That they have been through some really challenging seasons in their life. Um, they have real wounds. Their soul is drained, their heart is heavy, their future is uncertain, and it isn't obvious to us because they put their clothes on every day and they take on the responsibilities and they don't ask for help. And so we don't know that they're around us. So I think that it's helpful for us, how, how can we learn to better discern and identify individuals who we could serve better? And the first thing I think is this, is that assume everyone is broken. Just start with that assumption, including you. Every one of us has experienced brokenness in our life. I know that there are people who look like they've figured life out. Their income is what people want. Their fashion is what people desire. They've got the spouse and the kids everybody seems to want. They, they live in a great house. They, they got accepted to the right schools. They're, they're getting the academic grades. And what I can tell you is I've talked to a lot of people who look great like that, and they're really struggling. That struggling is the human condition. 
regardless of, of what else is happening in your life. And we can hide a lot of things in plain sight. We tend to delete the pictures that expose our needs and our brokenness. But that doesn't actually make the brokenness go away. So I really believe that if we don't acknowledge that brokenness in our own life, a couple of things tend to happen. One is, is that we'll find ways to try to numb ourselves from the pain that it causes. And our culture has an almost unlimited amount of options for numbing that pain. And lots of people exercise it. Uh, the second thing is, is that we can pass that pain on to the people that we're actually trying to protect. People that we love a lot. And we don't want to impose this on them, and yet it happens anyway. When we don't acknowledge our brokenness, we either try to numb it and or we pass it on. There could be another option, and that is if we found the courage to own our own brokenness and pain, it actually would help us not only to experience healing, but we'd actually become more compassionate. Because when you can see what has happened in you, you actually are able to see what is happening to someone else. And you see it quite differently. That, that it actually attracts us towards people and them towards us. That in order to be healed, we actually have to be long. Like there's this connection piece that has to take place. And you would be surprised how many people are actually won't run away in terror when they find out you too have experienced pain and wounds and bruises and brokenness. So I think assume everyone is broken, including you, and then remember we're not called, or we are called to serve others, not save others. I know that's going to probably seem a little bit uh, silly or maybe heretical. Only Jesus can save us. He allowed himself to be broken for us, not just by us. And he suffered every kind of pain humanly possible. And because of that, he knows how to bring healing to every kind of pain. He is the healer and the, the comforter and the one who mends the broken heart again. We are not saviors. We are servers. We're expanding our facilities. We do not believe that we are saving people. We are increasing space so that we can serve even more people. Our hope is that they will meet the Savior for themselves. Does that make sense to anybody? So we're not pulling people up. We're inviting people in. We all need healing. We all need Jesus. We're all in this together. Remember, we're, not, we're here to serve, not to save. It makes a big difference in our approach. So that kind of helps us identify uh, people who we could neighbor. But what are some good responses? And uh, here's one, one thing I want to talk to you about, is if we're going to neighbor, we need to get close enough to touch somebody. Close enough to touch somebody. There's all kinds of signs in our world that say, do not touch. If you go into a store with expensive items, do not touch. Uh, my father was in the hospital with a very contagious situation, and when I went into his room, I had to put on a gown and a mask and gloves and stuff over my feet, and I was not to touch anything in that room, and I was not to give him anything of mine to touch. There's just lots of things we're not supposed to touch. And uh, if, 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 you, if we go through life like that, we might feel safer but we actually can't get better. Jesus shows us this uh, great truth in Luke chapter 5. It says, while he was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. That's a big do not touch. He was covered with leprosy. And it tells us, let's see if I can get this to go. It's a bad sign when on the opening day of football, your remote doesn't work. <laughs> It's an omen. <laughs> Perhaps we should just stop and pray for the Buffalo Bills right now. <laughs> and, yeah, and, and some of you don't know what we're talking about. That's okay. How do we go from Jesus to the Buffalo Bills? Because, uh, I don't know why. So when Jesus saw... When, Jesus, when he saw Jesus, he fell with his face to the ground and begged him. 
Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. Leprosy is the big do not touch. If you had leprosy, one of the things you had to do is if you had to go into a public arena, you had to yell the words unclean so no one would accidentally touch you. Jesus didn't have to touch this man to heal this man, but he did it. He wanted that man to know something, and he wanted us to know something too. We have to get close enough to touch. And Jesus said, I am willing. Be clean. And immediately, the leprosy left him. If you're willing to get close enough to people to touch, the price could be high, but the reward could be really great. We often think that we're worried about how people will react. And in our world, there are lots of angry and loud voices that are being raised. And it is very easy to assume that the opposite of love is hate. It actually isn't. In fact, it is because of love that we often hate. If something that we love is threatened, we will get very angry very fast. And we will act in very provocative ways. The opposite of love is not hate. The opposite of love is apathy. It's when we don't care. It's when it doesn't matter anymore. Um, I had one of those moments with uh, the person laying on the side of the road one day. I was driving down the road, and there was, there was a person laying in the road. I, I stopped. They'd been hit by another car at least once. And I, I was stunned. I didn't know what to do. I, I reached in my trunk. I happened to have a blanket, and I threw it over him, and I yelled to one of the neighbors to call 911, and they did. And I watched a person walk up, and it was his father. And he looked at his son laying in the road, unconscious and bleeding, and he said these words, stupid kid. And he turned around and walked away. There are people in our world who get less upset about apathy than they do about anger. And that's actually the opposite of love. It should matter a lot more to us. Connecting with people is what makes the difference in our lives and in the world around us. So I know it's not easy. And I know that, the, like I said, the price can be high. But the rewards really are great. So just think back over your life. If you think about the moments that you felt a sense of purpose and something really mattered, it probably happened in one of two times. One is what, maybe when something was a really difficult season for someone else. They were going through a really hard time, and you were there for them. And what I can tell you is they probably don't remember anything that you said, but they do remember that you were there. And that matters a lot. Sometimes if they remember what you said after all these years, what you said was a not good thing. Like that, they remember a long time. They remember that you were there. And but our tendency is to move away from those moments because we, we feel uncomfortable in them. But that is where we can find a sense of purpose. And then celebrations, like when things are going really well. And there's kind of an automatic gratitude response that flows out of us when when something good is happening or something significant is being accomplished. And in our culture, it's easy to regulate those things to two events, weddings and funerals. Maybe, maybe there's more to life than getting married and getting buried. Maybe there are other moments where we could come along and connect and find a sense of purpose. So um, the... Next point that I want to bring to your attention, this is really fun. Take time enough to listen. Take time enough to listen. Uh, listening uh, is not as easy as it sounds, but it is important. This is what it tells us. Uh, Jesus had resurrected. He'd endured the crucifixion, had been buried, had raised, and he comes across some people who are in a conversation and they don't recognize him. And it says, Jesus asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along the way? And they stood still, their faces downcast. And one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus could have just said, of course I know it happened to me. And instead he says, what things? And then he listens. 
Jesus wasn't just the best teacher in the world, which he was. He was also the best listener in the world, which is why people believed he actually paid attention to them. A lot of us are worried about conversations. We get uncomfortable with them. We're not extroverts. And so we're worried we're going to be boring, not interesting. Here's the secret. It might, might help a lot of us. The, if you want to be interesting, be interested. Just listen. Just pay attention. If you want to have better conversations, be a better listener. It's tempting that when we listen, we're just waiting for the other person to talk so that we can add our two cents. Or sometimes we're just trying to, to, to have a clever or good response. And listening is, is, works best when we're just trying to understand someone better than respond better. And by the way, questions is a great way to help listening. If you listen to someone, you can ask a question about something that they said. Uh, I would encourage you to avoid three kinds of questions. If you're a parent or you're married, you've probably asked these questions. These are not good questions. One is the leading question. And the leading question usually starts like this. Isn't it really true that, and then they're going to say something. They're not looking for anything other than agreement. Those aren't great questions. Or the punishing question, a question that cannot be answered without humiliation. Why did you forget that again? You never get any usable information from a question like that. And then there's the command question, demanding something in the form of a question. When are you finally going to? Those are not great questions. But actually listening and then asking a question to better understand what's happening or what a person is going through. It's not as hard as it sounds. Just try to better understand. And then the third thing is dare enough to share. Dare enough to share. If we want to be a neighbor, there comes a point when there is an opportunity to speak up. And I'm not just talking about sharing our opinions. We all have them about most things. But there are other things to share than just our opinions. We could share our hopes. What are you hoping will happen in your life? What are you hoping will happen in your relationships? What do you hope will happen with your children and your grandchildren? What do you hope will happen with your church family? What do you hope will happen in the school you're attending? With the friends that you're developing? If you know someone who's struggling, what do you hope will happen for them? It's an amazing thing when we just start Acknowledging, sharing our hopes. And then we can also share things like our struggles, which feels a lot riskier because we're not sure how people are going to respond to us. But we can share our fears. And, and if anyone ever tells you, you know, I'm really afraid that, the natural inclination is to say, oh, you don't need to be afraid of that. You know, I have some fears in my life. One of the things that I'm afraid of is dogs. I've had dogs all my life. But I've been bitten by a lot of dogs. I, when, when people tell me, oh, you don't have to worry about our dog, it never bites. <laughs> I just, I think to myself, yet. <laughs> You're, I have had dogs run through entire crowds of people seeking me out like it was some kind of, on, on some kind of guidance mechanism. It was unbelievable. And, so I've learned not to just run, which I did a lot when I was younger. But that doesn't mean the fear's not there. And so, oh, you don't need to be afraid. That doesn't actually help. Okay. Maybe the goal is not to tell someone they don't need to be afraid. Maybe we could encourage them to be brave in the middle of a hard thing. That always helps. Uh, we can share wins. Every once in a while, something goes right in our life. And it's good to share it. Uh, maybe we comfort someone. Maybe we patiently waited for someone. Maybe we advocated for someone. Sometimes we actually accomplish what we set out to do. A finish line gets crossed. It's nice to have someone to celebrate it with. Sometimes an idea that we had was actually considered. And sometimes what we suggested actually gets done. And in that moment, it's just a wonderful thing to be able to know that you served God and someone else in that moment and to celebrate it. 
it's, it's one thing just to get through life. It's, an, it's another thing to experience life. So we're very serious about this idea of identifying who is our neighbor and knowing how to make neighbor. So we actually have some recommended options for you. And uh, I'd actually like Jonathan to come up and just take the next few minutes and just kind of walk you through what those options might look like. And uh, good luck with the remote. <laughs> so.